We all know stress isn't great, but what if chronic stress is creating a biological environment that raises your cancer risk? Adrenal fatigue isn't just burnout, it's your body screaming for help. And when cortisol is out of control, everything from immune health to hormone balance suffers. Let's break down how adrenal fatigue works, why it could be a missing link in cancer prevention, and how to protect your long-term health starting today. There's been a lot in the news recently about the increasing rates of cancer across the board, but especially cancer in younger and younger people. And I think that's something we need to take seriously. And as we dive into the why, why somebody gets cancer, what's happening here, we're having a lot of conversations. But the one conversation I'm not hearing that much about is the role of stress and cortisol in cancer, both diagnosis and recurrence. I know that so many people today, maybe yourself included, are walking around just not feeling good. More importantly, you're feeling super stressed. And that could be stress from your life, your workplace, or just living in the world today. And while we've talked a lot about stress and adrenal fatigue in different videos on this channel, I wanna spend some time today linking together the environment that chronic stress will create. And we know that it's all linked back up to cortisol and all the sisters and relatives of cortisol hormones. I wanna give you an example right at the top here where I'm looking at an article, this is from a journal published in 2023, talking about the association of serum cortisol and cortisol levels in the risk of occurrence and recurrence of breast cancer. And that's a big topic that we need to understand. I talked a lot about this with different guests, Dr. Christy Funk and Dr. Jen Simmons on the Whole Plus podcast. Those are great episodes, by the way. You should check those out. But both women, both surgical oncologists brought up the fact that stress and chronic stress and cortisol are linked to cancer. So feeling stress is not something we can take lightly. And unfortunately, in the Western medical model, when you walk in and talk about stress or feeling stress, you're typically diagnosed with anxiety or depression or a sleep disorder or something along those lines. While those are maybe great initial steps to help you get through a short period of time, it still doesn't address the long-term effects of chronic stress on your biochemistry. And that's something we need to understand. Let's break it down a little bit. Stress causes a lot of dysfunction in the body, mainly through the hormone cortisol. And as cortisol dysregulates, whether it gets too high or gets too low or flip-flops between being high and low, it's triggering multiple biochemical pathways in the body. Now, if that's just for a moment or a season, maybe not as much of a big deal. But when that stress is repetitive, happening over and over again, month to month, year to year, decade to decade, well, that accumulation of stress and cortisol dysfunction creates a state of chronic inflammation in the body. And we can actually measure that and look at that. Chronic inflammation in turn creates a state of chronic insulin dysregulation, which is the blood sugar hormone. And one of the things we've seen with cancer, when we get into the biochemistry of cancer and why it happens and what's going on, there is a huge relationship between inflammation insulin and development of cancer. Now we're not catching this in the exam room in the Western medical model. We're only catching cancer when it shows up on an image, right? Or in blood work. We're not thinking about it proactively and preventively as we should be. So it's not just about colonoscopies, mammograms, yes or no, you know, and all the different screening tests that are out there, all the genetic tests that are out there, there's been this explosion of genetic information trying to link all of that together. It's not just about that. It's about the bioterrain, the biochemistry, the environment of your body, your cells, your organs, your mind, your spirit, and what that is experiencing day in and day out. So we've got to be thinking about this a little bit differently. When we take the Eastern approach, to thinking about stress and cancer, we understand that we have to dive deeper earlier. So it's not just looking at cortisol levels, but it's also looking at inflammation markers. And it's also trying to understand what cortisol and inflammation is doing to other biochemical pathways in the body. What is it doing to your other hormones? What is it doing to blood sugar? 
What is it doing to your organs like your brain and your heart and your liver? And how do we treat it from there? Now, in the Eastern medical models, whether we're talking about Chinese medicine or Ayurveda or any of those different systems in medicine that are thousands and thousands of years old, they didn't have labs, right? They didn't have an ability to draw your blood or check your saliva or do these different things. But here's what they did do. They would assess you and try to understand where you were in this equation of health and stress and management of your overall life. If they would find that you were in a highly stressed state, they would then try to narrow that down. Should they focus on the gut? Should they focus on the liver? Should they focus on optimizing your chi or your nutrient energy? And then they would build a strategic plan. They would also talk about this idea of stress, which in Chinese medicine, by the way, they would diagnose as a triple energizer meridian issue or a heart meridian issue or see it as low kidney chi, all of these things we do in practice at Whole Plus. Or they would try to look at you from a dosha perspective and try to identify your dosha and help you identify what your blind spots are and what might be getting you stressed a little bit faster in creating this inflammatory state. Now, again, you can find your dosha by taking one of our quizzes. Go to wholeplus.co. We have the link to the quiz right here, and you can try to find out what your sort of power type or dosha is to understand your bandwidth for stress. And as they would manage this, it was a prescriptive formula around diet, maybe a few things to take, but definitely a mind-body strategy that incorporated acupuncture, which we now know all these years later, actually improves cortisol dysfunction and helps to bring those levels down. They would tackle inflammation by talking about healing foods and what to take but they would again craft and develop this very individual plan to help you manage the stress in your life and hopefully prevent something like cancer, which of course they couldn't name at the time. But let's bring it forward. Let's bring it to today and how we can bring these two worlds together that we know are so important in an environment where we're seeing higher and higher rates of cancer. One of the first things we need to be thinking about if you are experiencing stress and chronic stress, right? Things have been happening to you for a long period of time. You don't feel well. You feel like the hits just keep coming. Is that it's time to really dive in and understand your chemistry. Cancer needs an environment that's opportunistic. They want cells without energy. They want an inflamed state in the body. They want you to be more acidic. And those concepts are what you can actually prevent to allow cancer to stay far away from your body. As we continue to look at the chemistry of cancer, we understand how important it is to keep things away. Things like inflammation, insulin resistance, cells that don't have the energy and the support that they need. And those couple of concepts are what I keep diagnosing along with my team in the exam room when it comes to your cancer risk. So let's create a starting point. If you're experiencing stress or chronic stress, it's time to understand where you are with those three fundamental ideas. Where are your inflammation levels? Where are your blood sugar and insulin levels? And do you or do you not have oxidative stress? If you can tackle those three particular concepts, then we know you're going to be able to support the organs as they experience a season, a time, or even chronic stress. So taking that into account, Here's where I usually start with my patients. If we're tackling inflammation, we begin with a diet that is anti-inflammatory. That means removing processed and fast foods, looking at ingredients to make sure you're not getting in a lot of toxic preservatives or dyes that are going to influence your inflammatory load. The next step with that is thinking through foods that don't make you feel good. Now, again, that story is often individual, but in general, what we've seen over and over again in practice is that the common inflammatory foods really fall into the categories of gluten, dairy, excessive sugar, and alcohol. Those four seem to trigger more inflammation in the body as groups, even though you may individually have a food or two that's not on that list. So really pay attention. What does food do? Does it make you feel good? Are you tired after eating? All of those are signs of how food is serving you or working against you. And again, at Whole Plus, we have a lot of testing that can make that conversation much more precise and more personal for you. So an anti-inflammatory diet is definitely the starting point. 
But in addition to that, understanding where you are with inflammation is critical. And you can actually test that. And that's the part I think where I get frustrated that we have easy ways to test this. Insurance-based, by the way, ways of testing this to know what your body's doing. So testing a CRP or C-reactive protein, a homocysteine level, an ANA and the ANA profile all help to understand where you in particular are landing with inflammation. Now, if you're having symptoms, right, if you're having chronic stress and all those numbers are normal, but you're having a lot of the symptoms of inflammation that we actually talk about in this video right here, which include everything from joint pain, brain fog, rashes, gut health issues, all of that stuff, then you may want to go deeper with that testing. And that deeper testing for inflammation, and still on this idea that inflammation is linked to our cancer risk, the deeper testing there is looking at a TGF beta, a C4A, and even looking at some of your cytokines like interleukin-6 and interleukin-2. All of those will help you get a better understanding of where you are today when it comes to your cancer risk. And we're not even looping in and talking about the genetics yet. We'll talk about genetics in just a second. Moving on from inflammation, thinking about insulin and insulin resistance is another big concept around cancer. There's a lot of overlinking between blood sugar, diabetes, prediabetes, obesity and weight gain, belly fat and cancer. And here's the simple explanation for that that we now understand when we put all systems of medicine together is that blood sugar and blood sugar instability actually makes inflammation worse. It creates that environment for cancer cells to survive, to multiply and to grow. And all of that is happening at the sort of biochemistry level before it will ever show up on any kind of radiology or exam. In fact, we think the timeline for that might be up to 20 years. So all of this is taking place quietly, subtly, but meanwhile, you get surprised down the road at some point that you get a diagnosis of cancer. So how do you manage insulin resistance? Well, we just talked about an anti-inflammatory diet, really watching it, watching things like sugar, processed foods and preservatives, we've talked about that. In addition to that, the timing of your meals, eating at consistent intervals, being careful about overfasting or underfasting, which can actually work against you when it comes to managing cancer. So thinking about how your blood sugar levels are fluctuating, do you feel good throughout the day? Are you getting tired after meals? These are all signs that you might be having an issue with insulin and insulin resistance. Now, again, we can test for that and there are multiple ways to test. You can do a fasting insulin level. You can do a hemoglobin A1C and you can look and see what's going on with your blood sugar. But if you want to get even more granular than that, you can wear a glucose monitor and kind of track what your blood sugar is doing throughout the day. An optimal blood sugar is not the same as being fine. And I want to make sure you understand that because many people come in after wearing those monitors and tell me that they look okay. But okay is not enough to prevent your cancer risk. We want your blood sugars to be somewhere between about 70 and 90. And if you're going too high to the 100s, 110 or 120, that means you're more prone to insulin and to insulin resistance issues down the road. So that's another way to track and understand what's going on. In addition to that, we do a lot of food testing within the practice as well, where we can test your food intolerances and your food sensitivities and understand what that's doing in terms of your inflammatory and blood sugar risk. And there's a lot of that testing available now and we do it in practice as well. Let's do the third category that's tied to your risk for cancer and that's oxidative stress. Those are big words essentially describing how much energy each and every one of your cells have. Okay, so if you can imagine your cells running around in your body, they need to be plumped up full and full of life and full of vitality. And if they're not, because stress depletes nutrients and stress creates an environment where your nutrient load is higher and higher and higher. So if they're not, again, cancer has an opportunity to come in, multiply and grow. So really managing oxidative stress can be done in a lot of different ways. One of the ways is of course, to get the micronutrients you need. That's everything from the B vitamins, your amino acids, your fats, all of those are important for really helping your cells and your body. But in addition to that, actually bringing in a lot of antioxidants. This is glutathione that helps to flood the cell with energy. NAD is another one, it's a peptide that we love that again, provides energy to the cells. Vitamin C has been shown to be so helpful 
when it comes to cancer, even when you have a diagnosis, but also in terms of prevention. And alpha-lipoic acid are examples of those. Now, some of those you can get through food, but if you are depleted, because that's what stress will do, then sometimes you need those in either a supplement form, and many of those can also be an injection or IV form as well, and we do a lot of that in our clinics at Whole Plus. So inflammation, insulin resistance, oxidative stress, those are three concepts that stress or adrenal fatigue will drive and therefore increase your cancer risk. Now, beyond that, yes, there's a lot of testing, and we do that testing as well. That looks at your genetic risk, right, based off your family history. But then at the end of the day, what do genes really do, and what do those genetic markers do? They are dictating your chemistry. So the earlier you dive into a conversation around your chemistry, the better. So all of that to say, though, if you are stressed, it's important to understand that it's taking a toll on your body. And maybe the day is not today, right? Maybe it's a month from now or two months from now. But whenever it is where you have time and bandwidth, it's important to check these markers, these biomarkers, and understand where you landed after a season of stress or in the middle of stress so that you can build a strategic plan to turn all of that around. So hopefully by now you understand the link between stress, chronic stress, and your risk for cancer. This is why really taking this kind of holistic functional medicine approach is critical when it comes to managing your health, because oftentimes you get a diagnosis that's very late and you have a diagnosis of cancer, and now you have to go into a different mode of management of the active disease. Fortunately today, we understand that there is a much better way to approach health, understand your risk, and to really give and deliver actionable steps. So you can decrease your risk for cancer, at any age, you just have to jump in and dive into the concepts that surround your cancer risk. And here's what we know, stress and chronic stress is a big one. I'm hoping this video was helpful as you think about stress and your personal risk for cancer. Don't forget, I post new videos every week. And like and subscribe.